Euro Gold is driven by being the best civil engineering contractor in the Northwest, ensuring its clients are given the highest level of service that they deserve. Euro Gold work in a wide range of industry sectors, including house building, highways, commercial and industrial build. Lola Vita, Lola Vita is an award-winning, independently run Italian restaurant. Located on Rose Lane in the heart of Liverpool, real Italian style dishes using the best skillfully prepared, skillfully prepared by our chefs. Come and try our serious Italian experience. Supreme Upholstery. Supreme Upholstery Limited is a manufacturer of quality bespoke upholstered furniture. Come along with your ideas for that perfect sofa to fit your home and let Supreme bring your ideas to fruition. We also offer a service to the contract market, including large hotel groups and small family run business. No matter how large or how small your order, you will always get that personal service from our sales team. Come along and visit our showroom. Hello everyone and welcome to the show. This week we'll be meeting Tommy McLaughlin from the Leeds Iris Centre and we'll be finding out from him what plans they've got for the reopening of the centre. A few weeks ago we featured So The City which is a wonderful organisation creating outdoor activities for people. Well they also run a men's shed and we'll be meeting some of the people involved there. But first up Lou McCarries had a wonderful footballing career with Scotland, Celtic, Manchester United and Swindon Town. He also had a very successful managerial career, spending five wonderful successful years with Stoke City. Then in 2016, Lou decided he wanted to do something for the homeless people in Stoke. So he opened the McCarry Centre. Since then, Lou has worked tirelessly in helping people and trying to expand the centre to help as many homeless people as he possibly can. This is Lou's story. Lou, tell me, how did you get involved in helping the homeless? Um, it's about five years ago, sitting at home one night reading the local paper and we were talking about the number of homeless people in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, some people were saying there was hundreds and hundreds, other people were saying there was only a handful. So I just decided I'd jump in my car, go up to the city centre and see for myself how good or bad the, the homeless situation was. Got out of the car and quickly found uh, seven people in a doorway. An hour later, I'd, I'd come to the conclusion after walking around most of the town centre that there was just too many homeless people in Stoke. I went home, sat down, thought, could I do anything to, to help that situation? And if, if I could, what would it be? Um, and just decided that through my football contacts and knowing lots of people in Stoke when I was a manager here, that uh, I could get possibly get a building from the council, put a roof over the homeless people's heads, feed them, clothe them. Um, and I, I just knew I could do that. So I went to the council, asked them for a key to any building they had got the key to a building that we've been in for about three and a half years before we came here and um, started on the opening night with four homeless people and then it rose quickly to, to eight, to ten, to fifteen and uh, probably after a month I was looking after probably something in the twenties. Um, stayed there for the time that we've been there, three, almost four years. Uh, had to move because of Covid. Government decided that uh, our type of centre wasn't suitable. 
So we quickly had to move and I panicked and I was in my car and I was driving around Stoke looking for somewhere and um, couldn't really find anywhere that was suitable. And then my daughter lives on a farm um, and the farm down the road from her there was some of these pods you can see in the field and I, I was obviously uh, anxious to find out what they were all about, what they, what they were about and so I went into the farm and saw them for myself inside and outside and, and realised quickly in an emergency which we were in, I had to move quickly and, and find somewhere which is where you're in now, massive big warehouse which wouldn't have been ideal without the pods, brought the pods in as well and um, just luckily or whatever words, words you want to describe it, it's, it's worked for us. Government accepted it, the people who stay here accepted it, that they like the idea, television in every pod, which is a massive thing because I don't think people realise that homeless people when they're out in the streets don't walk around with a television in their bag and very seldom are they in contact with what's on television you know, what's happening in the world, what's happening here, who's won the FA Cup, who's in, who's in the final of the FA Cup or anything like that. And um, this is why we're here, we're here today and um, it's worked for us. So tell me a little bit about the pods, you know, what exactly, I know you've just mentioned there's a telly in there, but is it is it for each person and can they lock it up and is it their own kind it's of thing? It's their own and um, where's the nearest one there, you can probably see. It's pod number one, so yeah. there's a number on it. Pod number two next door, he's got an address, yeah. something that homeless people don't have. Yeah. So that was a help with a job centre in places like that. Inside the pods is a TV, yeah. and I rang up the League Managers Association, of which I'm a member, and asked them if could they could donate any televisions to us, and uh, they've got a sponsor called LG, and we had 48 televisions being sent to us. So we got the televisions, put them in the pods, Radiator in the pod as well, so when winter comes, we just turn the radiator on and it's, it's boiling hot in there. Um, and food, which I decided I could, I could supply um, with the help of, and I won't mention them because there's too many, with the help of all the organisations that supply food and deliver food and sell food, uh, we feed them four meals a day. Clothes, no problem. Plenty of clothes from the public. Plenty of donations as well. Um, a friend of mine from Manchester was here a couple of weeks ago and walked in and liked what we were doing, what I was doing, and just decided to give me £50,000 there and then. Wow. So the generosity yeah. of the public is why we're still here. Just tell me, Lou, how does it work? Can people come and go? Can they go out if they want to work and come back in the evening? Do they treat it like, we'll say, like their home? This like is their house? home. Yeah, yeah, this is their home. This is his house and that's the next person's house and so on. And if anybody thinks there's a quick recovery for anybody that's, that's been on the streets, they've got it badly wrong. Uh, the damage that is done to people that stay on the streets for a length of time, um, just to get in here, get that roof over their head, which is above us here, get the warmth, get the safety, and we make sure that they're well fed, four meals a day. Uh, they've, all got, they've all put weight on since they've been here all blaming me for it. Now you've made an enormous effort to get this off the ground originally and of course you're making a big big effort to keep it going and I'm delighted to say that you've been recognised by the Prime Minister in number 10 Downing Street. Yeah, to my surprise I got a call from his secretary about a week ago saying uh, he'd just like to in a letter acknowledge uh, what you've been trying to do here or what you've done here yeah. over the years and um, can he send you, of course you can send me a, an acknowledgement and a, a poster um, which doesn't happen every day of the week. No, we just come at the right time. <laughs> just as, it doesn't happen to ex-footballers or ex-managers. Oh, there's one or two around. But So it was shocked me, but he was there thanking me for, for the effort that me and the staff have put in here in the centre and, and what we've done over the years to, to help the homeless in Stoke-on-Trent. So it, it, was, it was quite a good moment, actually. You know, you have good moments in your life. 1977 when you go to Wembley and win the cup and you beat <laughs> Liverpool, that's one of those moments. And, and especially when you score the goal, that's a bonus. Well, I sort of scored the goal. Yeah, and when I started with Celtic, you know, yeah. as we, as we got a big, you've got a big following, Irish following, I know yeah. that. When I started with Celtic as a kid, yeah. I was a Celtic supporter, travelling on the supporters bus every week. Mm. What were the chances of me ever 
never mind playing for them. What are the chances of me ever uh, mixing with Jimmy Johnson and yeah. Bobby Murdoch and Billy McNeil? And the chances when I was on that supporters bus were zero. Yeah. But I got invited to a trial, I went up there and Jock Steen liked me and Sean Fallon, my, my reserve team manager from Cork, he, yeah. he liked me as well and he promised me that he, I was going to be a player and I doubted myself and he said, listen son, he says, I'm wise in the head and I've seen good youngsters come along but, and you're going to be a player. You, rest on those words, he said, and sure enough, with their help, became a player and yeah. played for Celtic, won Scottish Cup finals, won the league. Yeah. Great start to my, to my football career. And um, probably I intended to stay at Celtic for the whole of my football career, but being young and being um, not knowing how football works, um, I didn't know that one day that I'd be at Manchester United and I'd play for them and you know the connection between Manchester United and Celtic there is a connection there yeah, there is there is and yeah. um, so I've been I've been very very lucky in, in my football career been to a World Cup I know better players than me that have never been at a World Cup George Best never been at a World Cup but so that side of it's been quite lucky and I just thought after everything going so well, that night I was sitting at home in Stoke thinking about what could I do. Yeah. Um, I just thought, well, I haven't done a great deal for, yeah. for anybody in terms of homeless people or anything. What can I do? And I, and I just knew I could supply food. I knew I could get clothes for them. And I knew I could put a roof over their head. Any of the other things connected with homeless people and getting them back into to a normal sort of um, lifestyle, I, never believed I was capable of doing that. I believed I was capable of helping to achieve that, yeah. but most of the time it's, it's down to the, the people themselves. Now, how much do you rely on fundraising and people making donations to you and maybe people running a marathon for you or, or whatever? How, how much is the funding relying on that? The public have played a massive part in that and we'll, we'll continue to do it. Um, we're on the websites, Macari Foundation, You'll see all the links on there. Yeah. Um, and everything we get, we, I send them a little thank you letter, like the Prime Minister sent me a letter. <laughs> I send them a little thank you from the Macari Foundation, sign it, and um, it's, not, you know, it's, it's not compensation for what they've given us, because what they've given us is far greater than, than a card with my signature on it. But it all helps, and it's, it's brilliant that we get the response from, from the public. You know, the response has been fantastic. If people wanted to donate, how could they do that? If you go on our website, yeah. uh, Macari Foundation, all the links, I'm sure, should be there. And it keeps you informed of what we're doing on a daily basis. And that's it! Lou Macari, I think, got the final touch. Well done, Lou, on all the wonderful work you're doing in helping so many homeless people. You deserve all the support you can possibly get. And if anybody out there is thinking of doing some fundraising this year, why not consider the Macari Centre? Now we're going to take a little break. Don't go away. In part two, we'll be meeting Tommy McLaughlin from the Leeds Iris Centre and we'll be at the Men's Shed in Manchester. See you in a minute. Euro Gold is driven by being the best civil engineering contractor in the Northwest, ensuring its clients are given the highest level of service that they deserve. Euro Gold work in a wide range of industry sectors, including house building, highways, commercial and industrial build. Lola Vita, Lola Vita is an award-winning, independently run Italian restaurant. Located on Rose Lane in the heart of Liverpool, real Italian style dishes using the best skillfully prepared, skillfully prepared by our chefs. Come and try our serious Italian experience. Supreme Upholstery. Supreme Upholstery Limited is a manufacturer of quality bespoke upholstered furniture. Come along with your ideas for that perfect sofa to fit your home and let Supreme bring your ideas to fruition. We also offer a service to the contract market, including large hotel groups and small family run business. Music 
No matter how large or how small your order, you will always get that personal service from our sales team. Come along and visit our showroom. Welcome back. Now we're off to meet Tommy McLaughlin, who has been manager of the Leeds Irish Centre for 50 years. Tommy, of course, this last 12 months has been a horrible time for us all. How have you coped here at the Leeds Irish Centre? Well, it's been very, very difficult for the last 14 months. And in between that time, we have lost so, so many of our members, including JIB, John Brennan, the disco man from Manchester. We miss him so, so much. But again, our condolences to all our members and uh, families. And uh, hopefully, in a few weeks, we will open up again and get back to normal. It's been a terrible year. We missed our 50th anniversary celebrations of the book we have, the book that came out. Missed all that. Everything was so organised with so much to happening here. And that was all, all to waste. It was, it was a shame. Ah, now, yeah. of course, we're all hoping that the 21st of June we'll be able to get out and enjoy ourselves again. What plans going forward now? Everything going well, of course, uh, for the Leeds Iris Centre. Yes, I believe on the first night that we open, we're going to have the Kyotas and they're going to play a Cayley night and a traditional night. That would be nice just to welcome the people back. Yeah. But it's, we've got to be very careful about our entertainers, especially the ones from Ireland, because they're finding it difficult at the moment to, uh, to commit. Yeah. I think after September, maybe they might commit to dates, you know, but at the moment, uh, very rare. But we're trying, we're trying our best, but I think people just want to get back, yeah. back to normality, back to see the friends, and hopefully, as I say, um, things will come right and I get our Tuesday club again. We'll open that on the 22nd of June. Hopefully, people will be back, you know. Again, we know there's going to be a lot of people missing. We recognise that and uh, We'll try to overcome that and get back to normal as, be as best we can. Now, you mentioned there, of course, about your 50th anniversary last year, which, yes. which didn't take place. But in replacement of that, of course, you mentioned the book there, yes. your, your book to celebrate the 50 years. And that's been very successful for you. It has. It has. And, it, you know, you can't believe this, where it's been. It's been sent all over the world. And that is the truth. And uh, as I said, place, because Irish people are everywhere, yeah. everywhere. But uh, it has gone, as I say, remembering people that were here as youngsters that are now uh, business people in America, Australia, even to Dubai, Dubai. You'd be so, so surprised where it's gone. We had 1,400 uh, printed and we just left now, we're just less than 40. So for the 40 that's left now, how can people get them? Once the centre opens after the 21st, they'll be able to come in here to purchase oh, them? Oh, absolutely, that? yes. They can either ring up or just pop, pop in and uh, see Julie and uh, there's no problem but it's a, it's a, i'm delighted with it because it's a great read absolutely involving everything everything that happened in the center you know whether it be sport whether it be music uh, or whatever and uh, even the history of the irish in leeds as yeah. well and of course there's so many beautiful photographs in there representing a lot of people that yes. used to come in here yes. but also representing all the great committees you've had down the years yes the men that uh, had the foresight for to build this place in the first instance back in 1969 when they acquired the land and then built it. Uh, little did we know that was going to be here for 50 plus years, you know, but uh, those gentlemen that had the foresight was brilliant, absolutely. So Tommy, after the 21st of June, hopefully you'll be open then. Are you open then for weddings and anniversaries oh, and celebrations and so on? Absolutely. Our, our, um, our diary is absolutely from, from uh, the June date. Yes, absolutely, because a lot of people um, put it put their weddings off and they're now booking back in again. So we have uh, an awful lot of weddings from, from June, July, right through to Christmas, we have indeed, back to normal. Uh, we have a Sunday Calvary, which uh, has got very, very popular and people are already booking their, their tables. And it's brilliant, lovely to see the people and uh, it's got really, really popular. And you spoke about bands earlier on coming over from Ireland, but yes. of course you've got a big night on the 2nd of October. The one and only Nathan Carter. Nathan came here, as I said, as a 17-year-old playing his uh, keyboard in, in the uh, members bar. And we've watched him progress all through. He's been absolutely brilliant. And it's lovely to see him done so well. He's just a lovely lad. Yes, and he never, he never forgot us, you know, and he's coming now, and it's a Saturday night, by the way, yeah. on the 2nd of October, yes. 
What about tickets for that event? I think they're all gone, but uh, again, Julie is the person, if you want to ring in and just check, but the, yes, the, there is a big event. It's, it's like a, a theatre style, you know, like a concert, you know. Some tunes up on Grafton Street on a grand old Dublin date When she walked right up and she said hello And I stopped to ask her name When I saw her face for the first time Sarah Jane hey. Well she pulled out the fiddle and she rising up the bowl and she began to play As she jumped right in with the jigs and the reels and the sure as a black I'm sure if you're booking any of your celebrations at the Leeds Iris Centre, Tommy and Chris and all the team will really look after you very well. Now, So The City is a wonderful organisation for creating outdoor activities for people and they also run a men's shed. Now we're going to bob along to meet some of the people involved there and find out how it's helping them. Paul, how long have you been attending the men's shed? Uh, I've been tending the men's ship six to seven weeks. And how have you settled in? Uh, it's been quite uh, interesting, meeting a, a lot of other guys, getting, getting to know them. And you've been making a few things, I believe. Tell me what you've made so far. I've made this wee table. Uh, we made ones for ourselves, but these ones are going to be for the sale on for the, for the men's ship and uh, bird, bird's nests as well. Have you been always interested in making things? Yeah, yeah, I like working with my hands. How often do you come here? Every Friday. So how did you find out about the men's shed? Oh, uh, God, it was through a, a, a girl. I've been going to a, a girl through Irish Community Care, believe it or not, and she uh, recommended me. So how long have you been here in England? Uh, on and off, about 14 years. F 14, yeah, I've been back home. I've been abroad, yeah. So where's home for you? Belfast, in, in the north, yeah. yeah. So are you going to continue on here now, coming to the men's shed and uh, learning to make some new things? Absolutely, until uh, work comes along, I'm, I'm actually looking for work. So Joe, how long have you been coming to the men's shed? Well, Martin, I've been coming here for, oh, I'd say, just over two years now. And what have you been making? Yeah, I think the first thing I made was a toolbox. And then I went on to making some cupboards for my flat. Uh, I've made a breadboard. Today I've been working on a little uh, uh, bench thing that I'm making for my flat. Generally speaking, it's just stuff because I don't have access to a, a workshop at home. Um, this is why I've sort of found this place and I can come and do bits of woodwork and what have you. How important is the men's shed to the community? I think it's very important because um, what with the lockdown and everything, um, I mean, we were shut for about six months due to that. But it's, I think if you're, if you're a single person, you can become a bit isolated. And, you know, if you're, if you're trying to stay away from pubs and things like that, getting out and sort of meeting other people in a, in a different environment is <coughs> healthy, you know. Plus, you, you know, we do make things for the community, as you can see. You know, we have a planters and normally we have a repair cafe once a month. So you can bring in electrical appliances and, you know, fix them up. Uh, they do a women's shed on a Thursday, which is very popular. So it's very good for the community. 
Would you like to encourage more people to come along? Um, well, it's only sort of like a smallish place, but we could do different days. I think more people should be involved. How important to people's well-being is it that you come along and you take an active role in making something here and take a little bit of pride in it? I think it's it does everybody good to you know work with their hands and sort of come out and sort of meet people and have a crack, you know. And you were telling me you've got some good Irish heritage as well. Oh, I'm my mother. Yeah, she was from Brosna, County Kerry. I spent a bit of time there. I went to the Christian Brothers in Tralee for a few years myself, prior to joining the Navy. But um, yeah, I've had some good times in Kerry. And do you enjoy? Two yeah. cans with Dana one year, the Rosa Tralee. <laughs> And do you enjoy coming here? I do, yeah. yeah. You've made friends? Oh, I have, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we didn't have a Christmas do last year on account of the, the lockdown, but the Christmas before, we had a great party. And we're talking about organising a sea fishing trip this um, summer. You know, with the things that we're actually selling, we're um, you know, hoping to sort of get a bit of money together and go sea fishing. Well, well done. Well, listen, Joe, great to see you today and enjoy the sea fishing. All right, thank you very much, Martin. It's great to see so much wonderful work being done by so many great organisations. Well done to everybody on tonight's show. Now, that brings us to the end. Don't forget Henry McGlade is back with us with his show from County Mayo next Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. And we are here at 7.30 with the Irish in the UK. Until then, take good care.